Chapter 5 Realms of the Soil The thin layer of soil that forms a patchy covering over the continents control our existence and that of every other animal of the land. Without soil, land plants as we know them could not grow. Without plants, no animals could survive. Yet, if our agriculture-based life depends on the soil, it is equally true that soil depends on life. Its very origins and the maintenance of its true nature being intimately related to living plants and animals. For soil is in a part a creation of life, born of a marvelous interaction of life and non-life long eons ago. The parent materials were gathered together as volcanoes poured them out in fiery streams as waters running over the bare rocks of the continents wore away even the hardest granite and as the chisels of frost and ice split and shattered the rocks. Then living things begin to work their creative magic and little by little these inert materials became soil. Lichens, the first, the rock's first covering, aided the process of disintegration by the acid secretions and made a lodging place for other life. Mosses took hold in the little pockets of simple soil soil formed by crumbling bits of lichen, by the husks of minute insect life, by the debris of a fauna beginning its emergence from the sea. Life not only formed the soil, but other living things of incredible abundance and diversity now exist within it. If this were not so, the soil would be a dead and sterile thing. By their presence and by their activities, the myriad organisms of the soil make it capable of supporting the Earth's green mantle. The soil exists in a state of constant change, taking part in cycles that have no beginning and no end. New materials are constantly being contributed as rocks disintegrate, as organic matter decays, and as nitrogen and other gases are brought down in rain from the skies. At the same time, other materials are being taken away, borrowed for temporary use by living creatures. Subtle and vastly important chemical changes are constantly in progress, converting elements derived from air and water into forms suitable for use by plants. In all these things, in all these change living organisms are active agents. In all these changes living organisms are active agents. There are few studies more fascinating and at the same time more neglected than those of the teeming populations that exist in the dark realms of the soil. We know too little of the threads that bind the soil organisms to each other and to their world and to the world above. Perhaps the most essential organisms in the soil are the smallest. The invisible host of bacteria, 
and of thread-like fungi. Statistics of their abundance takes us at once into astronomical figures. A teaspoon of so topsoil may contain billions of bacteria. In spite of their minute size, the total weight of the host, of this host of bacteria, in the top foot of a single acre of fertile soil may be as much as a thousand pounds. Ray fungi growing in long thread-like filaments are somewhat less numerous than the bacteria. Yet, because they are larger, their total weight in a given amount of soil may be about the same. The small green cells called algae that make up the microscopic plant life of the soil. Bacteria, fungi, and algae are the principal agents of decay, reducing plant and animal residues to their component minerals. The vast cyclic movements of chemical elements such as carbon and nitrogen through soil and air and living tissue could not proceed without these microplants. Without the nitrogen-fixing bacteria, for example, plants would starve for want of nitrogen, though surrounded by a sea of nitrogen-containing air. Other organisms form carbon dioxide, which, as carbon di carbonic acids, aids in dissolving rock. Still, other soil microbes perform various oxidations and reductions by which minerals such as iron, manganese, and sulfur are transformed and made available to plants. Also present in prodigious numbers are microscopic mites and primitive wingless insects called springtails. Despite their small size, they play an important part in breaking down the residues of plants, aiding in the slow conversion of the litter of the forest floor to soil. The specialization of some of these minute creatures for their tasks is almost incredible. Several species of mite, for example, can begin life only within the fallen needles of a spruce tree. Sheltered here, they digest out the inner tissues of the needle. When the mites have completed their development, only the outer layer of the cells remain. This truly staggering task of dealing with the tremendous amount of plant material in the annual leaf fall belong to some of the small insects of the soil and the forest floor. They macerate and digest the leaves and aid in mixing the decomposed matter with the surface soil. Besides all this horde of minute but ceaselessly toiling creatures, there are, of course, many larger forms. For soil, life runs the gamut from bacteria to mammals. Some are permanent residents of the dark subsurface layers. Some hibernate or spend definite parts of their life cycles in underground chambers. Some freely go come and go between their burrows and the upper world. In general, the effects of all this habitation of the soil is to aerate it and improve both its drainage and the penetration of water throughout the layers of plant growth. Of all the larger inhabitants of the soil, probably none is more important than the earthworm. Over three quarters of a century ago, 
Charles Darwin published a book titled The Formation of Vegetable Mold Through the Action of Worms with Observations on Their Habits. In it, he gave the world its first understanding of the fundamental role of earthworms as geologic agents for the transport of soil. A picture of surface rocks being gradually covered by fine soil brought up from below by the worms. In annual amounts running to many tons to the acres in most favorable areas. At the same time, quantities of organic matter contained in leaves and grass, as much as 20 pounds to the acre, pounds to the square yard in six months, are drawn down into the burrows and incorporated in soil. Darwin's calculations showed that the toil of earthworms might add a layer of soil an inch to an inch and a half thick in a 10-year period. And this is by no means all they do. They, their burrows aerate the soil, keep it well drained, and aid the penetration of plant roots. The presence of earthworms increases the nitrifying powers of the soil bacteria and decreases putrefication of the soil. Organic matter is broken down as it passes through the digestive tracts of the worms and the soil is enriched by their excretory products. This soil community then consists of a web of interwoven lives, each in some way related to the other. The living creatures depending on the soil, but the soil in turn a vital element of the earth, only so long as this community within it flourishes. The problem that concerns us here is one that has received little consideration. What happens to these incredibly numerous and vitally necessary inhabitants of the soil when poisonous chemicals are carried down into their world, either introduced directly as soil sterilants or born on the rain that has picked up a lethal contamination as it filters through the leaf canopy of forest and orchard and cropland. It is reasonable to suppose that we can apply a broad spectrum insecticide to kill the burrowing larval stages of a crop destroying insect, for example, without also killing the good insects whose function may be the essential one of breaking down organic matter? Or can we use a non-specific fungicide without also killing the fungi that inhabit the roots of many trees in a beneficial association that aids the tree in extracting nutrients from the soil? The plain truth is that this critically important subject of the ecology of the soil has been largely neglected even by scientists and almost completely ignored by control men. Chemical control of insects seems to have proceeded on the assumption that the soil could and would sustain any amount of insult via the introduction of poisons without striking back. The very nature of the soil, the very nature of the world of the soil, has been largely ignored. From the few studies that have been made, a picture of the 
impact of pesticides on the soil is slowly emerging. It is not surprising that the studies are not always in agreement, for soil types vary so enormously that what causes damage in one may be innocuous in another. Light sandy soils suffer far more heavily than humus types. Combinations of chemicals seem to do more harm than separate applications. Despite the varying results, enough solid evidence of harm is accumulating to cause apprehension on the part of many scientists. Under some conditions, the chemical conversions and transformations that lie at the very heart of the living world are affected. Nitrification, which makes atmospheric nitrogen available to plants, is an example. The herbicide 2,4-D causes a temporary interruption of nitrification. In recent experiments in Florida, lindane, heptachlor, and VHC or benzene hexachloride reduced nitrification after only two weeks in the soil. VHC and DDT have significantly detrimental effects a year after treatment. In other experiments, BHC, aldrin, lindane, heptachlor, and DDD all prevented nitrogen-fixing bacteria from forming the necessary root nodules on leguminous plants. A curious but beneficial relation between fungi and the roots of higher plants is seriously disrupted. Sometimes the problem is one of upsetting the delicate balance of populations by which nature accomplishes far-reaching aims. Explosive increases in some kinds of soil organisms have occurred when others have been reduced by insecticides. Disturbing the relation of predator to prey, such changes could easily alter the metabolic activity of the soil and affect its productivity. They could also mean that potentially harmful organisms formerly held in check could escape from their natural controls and rise to pest status. One of the most important things to remember about insecticides in soil is their long persistence, measured not in months, but in years. Aldrin has been recovered after four years, both at traces and more abundantly as converted to D. Aldrin. Enough toxaphene remains in sandy soil 10 years after its application to kill termites. Benzene hexachloride persists at least 11 years, heptachlor or more toxic derived chemical at least 9. Chloridane has been recovered 12 years after its application in the amount of 15% of their original quantity. Seemingly, moderate applications of insecticides over a period of years may build up fantastic quantities in soil. Since the chlorinated hydrocarbons are persistent and long-lasting, each application is merely added to the quantity remaining from the previous one. The old legend that a pound of DDT to the acre is harmless 
means nothing if spraying is repeated. Potato soils have been found to contain up to 15 pounds of DDT per acre. Corn soils up to 19. The cranberry bog under study contained 34.5 pounds to the acre. Soil from apple orchards seemed to reach the peak of contamination with DDT accumulating at a rate that almost keeps pace with its rate of annual application. Even in a single season, the orchard sprayed four or more times. DDT residues may build up to peak of 30 to 50 pounds. With repeated springs over the years, the range between trees is from 26 to 60 pounds to the acre, under trees up to 113 pounds. Arsenic provides a classic case of the virtually permanent poisoning of the soil. Although arsenic as a spray on growing tobacco has been largely replaced by the synthetic organic insecticides since the mid 40s. The arsenic content of cigarettes made from American grown tobacco increased more than 300 percent between the years of 1932 and 1952. Later studies have revealed increases of as much as 600 percent Dr. Henry Satterley, an authority on arsenic toxicology, says that although organic insecticides have been largely substituted for arsenic, the tobacco plants continue to pick up the old poison. For the soils of tobacco plantations are now thoroughly impregnated with residues of a heavy and relatively insoluble poison, arsenic of lead. This will continue to release arsenic in soluble form. The soil of a large proportion of the land planted to tobacco has been subjected to cumulative and well nigh permanent poisoning, according to Dr. Satterley. Tobacco grown in the eastern Mediterranean countries where arsenical insecticides are not used has shown no such increase in arsenic content. We are therefore confronted with a second problem. We must not only be concerned with what is happening to the soil, we must wonder to what extent insecticides are absorbed from contaminated soils and introduced into plant tissues. Much depends on the type of soil, the crop, and the nature and concentration of the insecticide. Soil high in organic matter releases smaller quantities of poisons than others. Carrots absorb more insecticide than any other crop studied. If the chemical used happens to be lindane, carrots actually accumulate higher concentrations than are present in the soil. In the future, it may become necessary to analyze soils for insecticides before planting certain food crops. Otherwise, even unsprayed crops may take up enough insecticide merely from the soil to render them unfit for market. This very sort of contamination has created endless problems for at least one leading manufacturer of baby foods who has been unwilling to buy any fruits or vegetables on which toxic insecticides have been used. The chemical which caused him the most 
trouble was benzene hexachloride, BHC, which is taken up by the roots and tubers of plants, advertising its presence by a musty taste and odor. Sweet potatoes grown in California fields where BHC has been used two years earlier contain residues that had to be rejected. In one year in which the firm had contracted in South Carolina for its requirement of sweet potatoes, so large a proportion of the acreage was found to be contaminated that the company was forced to buy in the open market at a considerable financial loss. Over the years, a variety of fruits and vegetables grown in various states had to be rejected. The most stubborn problems were concerned with peanuts. In the southern states, peanuts were usually grown in rotation with cotton on which BHC is extensively used. Peanuts grown later in this soil pick up considerable amounts of the insecticide. Actually, only a trace is enough to incorporate the telltale musty odor and taste. The chemical penetrates the nuts and cannot be removed. Processing, far from removing the mustiness, sometimes accentuates it. The only course open to any manufacturer determined to exclude BHC residues is to reject all produce tr treated with the chemical or grown on soils contaminated with it. Sometimes the menace is the crop itself. A menace that remains as long as the insecticide contamination is in the soil. Some insecticides affect sensitive plants such as beans, wheat, barley, or rye, retarding root development or depressing growth of seedlings. The experience of the hop growers in Washington and Idaho is an example. During spring of 1955, many of these growers undertook a large-scale program to control the strawberry root weevil, whose larvae had become abundant on the roots of the hops. On the advice of agricultural experts and insecticide manufacturers, they chose heptachlor as the control agent. Within a year, after the heptachlor was applied, the vines in the treated yards were wilting and dying. In the untreated fields, there was no trouble. The damage stopped at the border between treated and untreated fields. The hills were replanted at great expense, but in an Another year, the new roots, too, were found to be dead. Four years later, the soil still contained heptachlor, and scientists were unable to predict how long it would remain poisonous, or to recommend any procedure for correcting the condition. The Federal Department of Agriculture which, as late as 1959, found itself in the anomalous position of declaring heptachlor to be acceptable for use on hops in the form of a soil treatment, belatedly withdrew its registration for use. Meanwhile, Hop growers sought what redress they could in the courts. As applications of pesticides continued, 
and the virtually indestructible residues continue to build up in the soil, it is almost certain that we are heading for trouble. This was the consensus of a group of specialists who met at Syracuse University in 1960 to discuss the ecology of the soil. These men summed up the hazards of using such potent and little understood tools as chemical and radiation. A false, a few false moves on the part of man may result in destruction of soil productivity and the arthropods may well take over.